Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Come on in the room. Come on in the room. It is time for our morning devotion. For those of you who don't know, I'm Pastor Tina Patton, co-pastor of Kingdom Life Christian Cathedral, located in the city of South Bend, Indiana. And Monday through Friday, I come on uh, Facebook Live just to give a word to the people of God to allow them to join in on my morning meditation, the time that I spend with the Lord. Good morning, lady. Come on into the room. As you come into the room, please greet one another. Let us know that you are here. Let me know that you're here. This is a time that you can join in and share in the devotion that the Lord has for you. Good morning, Sister Dora. Brother Joe, good morning. Good to see all of you. We're going to go right before the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to uh, begin to give what I believe the Lord has given to me today for you all. Good morning, Sister Angela, Sister Nicole. Good morning. Father God, we just bless your name, Lord, and we thank you because you are an awesome God. Lord, you're a mighty God. You're powerful, Lord God. And God, there is no God, nobody like you. We thank you, Lord God, that we've placed everything in, our, in your hands, oh God, because you, God, are the center, God, of everything that we do. God, you are the reason that we move, we live, we have our being, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, for our laying down last night, God, and for our early rising this morning, oh Lord God. We thank you, God, for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So right now, Lord, I decrease in myself and I increase in you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, you give me the ability to do all things well. I thank you, Lord God, for your power, Lord, for your anointing, Lord God, for your greatness. Oh God, I thank you, God, for it this morning because, God, I feel your presence and your power, God, already. And Lord, I know that when the anointing comes, Lord God, yokes are broken, Lord God. Burdens are lifted, Lord God. Shackles, God, are released in the name of Jesus. So I thank you, Lord God, for what your people shall hear and experience on this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, people of God. This morning, what we're talking about is a partnership with a purpose, a partnership with purpose. We're talking about there being um, two being better than one. Coming from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I'm going to start with verse 8 this time. I think a lot of times we start with verse number 9, and we get right into what the word of the Lord is saying in verse number 9, but I want to go up to number 8. And I'm just going to read that and get right into it, if that's uh, great for you (laughs) Uh, thank you, Brother Joe. Ecclesiastics, verse number, uh, chapter 8, verse number, chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse number 8. It says, there is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all of his labors. <laughs> what was it saying? He's by himself. He has to work by himself. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all of his labor, all of his work. But listen what it continues to say. It says, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. No matter what he's done to amass great things into his life, he's still not satisfied. He's working his fingers to the bone. Good morning, Sister Carla. Emily, good morning, niece Soror. It's good to see you. He's working his fingers to the bone. He's working two and three jobs and But he still is not satisfied. His eye is not satisfied for his labor. But the word of the Lord goes on to say, but he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? Why? He says he never asks, why am I doing all this work? Why am I depriving myself of the greater things of life? And I'm just doing all this work. And it goes on to continue to say, there also is vanity And a grave misfortune, vanity. Ecclesiastics talk about vanity, things that are meaningless, purposeless. And then the ninth verse says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Two are better than one. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe unto him who is alone when he falls. So Solomon here in Ecclesiastics is warning us against being by ourselves, doing things by ourselves, trying to do all the work alone, wondering who we're working for. Why is it that we're working? It says, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly or not easily broken. We find here at Ecclesiastics was written by David's son Solomon. And all throughout the book, 
Solomon here is trying to find meaning in his life. It seemed that after he wrote the book of Proverbs, with his book was full of wisdom. We get to Ecclesiastics, and now he's trying to find meaning in all that he has done. It seems that perhaps Solomon is not practicing what he has preached. He seems that he, he was the greatest man. He has the greatest, most, most wisdom of all men in the word of God. But he seems that it got to the point where he had a lot of things and he wondered why he did all the work for all the things that he had done. So he was he somewhat saying to us, he didn't take his own advice in the word that he was being sp- uh, speak, spoken in the Bible. So Ecclesiastes 1, it says the words of the preacher all throughout Ecclesiastes it talks about the words of the preacher, preacher giving wisdom to those and the son of David, king of Jerusalem. He talks about vanity of all vanities. Why do we do certain things? Is it just for us? Is it just so that we can look good? Is it just for we so that we can feel good? He warns us not to waste our lives on things that are worthless. See, Solomon here is warning us not to waste our lives on things that are worthless, not to waste our good on things that are worthless, not to waste all of our good breath, not to waste the goodness that we have while we are doing things that are all, Solomon is saying to us, vanity. And then he tells us that we need to live more godly lives, live because there is an eternal significance to what it is we're trying to do. We have to have spiritual priorities in all that we do. He's saying two is better than one. And so Solomon here is telling us that there is more meaning to our lives and we just got to find that meaning. We got to find that purpose. And so in Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 through 12, good morning, Brother Hunter, Sister Kelly, good morning. Solomon is teaching us in order to live a life that counts, you got to learn to value relationships over possession. You got to learn to understand that you, your partnerships have a purpose. You got to learn to value relationships over possession. And so you got to value people more than you value things is what I'm just saying here. And you got to find pleasure. You got to find your joy in fellowship, not in the things that you have or not in the things that you do, not in what people call you, but you got to find your joy in fellowship with somebody else. And he makes the point really clear in this passage of scripture that I'm looking at today. And he says that two are better than one. Now, don't get me all mixed up. I know some of you are saying, but Pastor Tina, I'm single. I'm not talking about those kinds of relationships where where you perhaps are married or single. That's not what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about is just using your relationships, your divine connections, using because a lot of times, even if we are married, Sometimes we live single lives. Come in, how many of you can attest to that? And sometimes single lives are lived even if we are married. So this morning, I'm not talking about being married or being single. What I'm talking about is relationship and how important relationship is, not only in the body of Christ, but for you so that your life may be better and your life may be more fulfilled. So Ecclesiastics, we look at this word of God in Ecclesiastics chapter two. Again, he talks about being the preacher and over and over again, he talks about things that are meaningless and utterly meaningless. And and to Solomon, everything was meaningless. What he was saying, he had so many great things, so many things that he had done, so much he had accomplished, so much that he had. But what was he saying is what does it all mean? It can all mean nothing. If you don't have someone to share it with, if you're not sharing that with somebody else, good morning, Sister Sherry, good morning, Sister Brandy. If you're not sharing it with somebody else, it's all meaningless. So everything he was saying that he possessed, everything that he, he could created for himself, he was saying that was worthless. And oftentimes Satan puts things in our face. He puts things in our path and we chase after those things. Instead of the songs I'm chasing after you, God, we chase after the things that Satan has laid out for us. And only to find out that the more we chase after those things that Satan has laid out for us, the further and further and further away from God we get. The the more we chase after what Satan has for us, the further and further away from God that we get. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God does not want you to have things. 
because the Bible says that the Lord, he created you. He gave you the ability to get well and listen, and he would that you prosper and be in health and all things that your soul does prosper. So don't get me mixed up when I'm talking about the things that we're chasing that Satan has, has put in our faces because a lot of times we know, and we know Satan's job is to kill, steal, and destroy. And a lot of times Satan may put something in our way, put something in our path that will lead us away. We understand that will lead us away from the things of God instead of leading us to it. But the Bible says the blessing of God makes us rich and it adds no sorrow to it. And so when there are things that we are chasing, that we're chasing from Satan, sometimes we, we find those things have sorrow to it. And we're wondering why we wondering why we got that new car because we couldn't afford it. And it brought sorrow. And we began to say, this was a blessing from God. But then after a while, it came that the repo man came. We said, well, maybe it wasn't a blessing at all because it was, it was Satan getting us further and further away from the benefits, from the prize, from the glory of God. It was not a blessing at all. So we have to be mighty careful of the things that we chase that are not of God. And we have to ask God. We have to consult God. The Bible says that if we seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness, I'm not going away from the text of two is better than one, but if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Lord is saying all of these things, all the things that we need for our life, for our health, for our healing, for our happiness, all the possessions that we need, all the resources that we need, the Lord is saying that I will add those things unto you. Whatever it is that you need, he says, I'm going to do it, but seek me first and then I'm going to put it into your hands. But Satan and sin always keeps us away. Listen, longer than we want to stay away. How many of you know, I don't know, I may be preaching to the choir today, but how many of you know that when you stay away from the body of Christ, when you stay away from church and you stay away one week and then you stay away two weeks, it gets easier and easier for you not to then assemble yourself with the people of God. How many of you know that? Have you noticed that? Maybe not about you, but perhaps about somebody else, that the more you stay away from the people of God, the more you stay away from the fire of God, God, the more you stay away from the anointing of God, from the presence of God, the, the, the more it, it easier it becomes for you to do that. Satan, he wants you to stay away. He wants to isolate you. He wants to make things look better for you on the other side than it would be if you were to be in the body of Christ, in the place where the Lord would have for you. Satan tempts us. He does. He tempts us and he tries to lead us away from the things of God. And the more he tries to lead us away, we have to have discerning minds and discerning spirits to know that as Solomon is saying, I'm not trying to satisfy myself. It's all vanity is what Solomon is saying here. I'm not trying to chase a mirage. I'm not trying to chase what looks like is going to be good for me. But I only want the things of God. Because when I do that, I gain nothing. I gain nothing when I go after the things of the enemy. The Lord is saying to us, come, come to me all who are weary, who are burdened. Satan is the one that burdens us. He's the one that makes us weary. And the word here is saying that when you are by yourself, you become weary. You become weary because you have not asked anyone to help you. Now, I have to say, I have to repent of that myself sometimes because I become weary sometimes because perhaps I don't ask people to help me. Perhaps because I think I got so much going on or because I think that perhaps there are people who maybe won't want to do some of the things that I'm asking them to do. But I, listen, I got a revelation from this word on today that two are better than one. Two are better than one because we don't want there to be an end to us without fulfilling the purpose that God has in our lives. There is a partnership with purpose in your life. You just got to find that partner to be in purpose with. Amen. So listen, the Lord has come that we would have abundant life, that life more abundantly. The greatest commandment that the Lord has given to us is that we would love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And then the word says, and the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And the law hangs on these two commands, love God, love people, and make sure then that you are serving both of them. 
And Solomon was talking to us about this life, about loving God, about loving people, and about serving them both, and the purpose that we fulfill when we are in connection, when we are in partnership with one another. So first we look at verse number eight, and it's it just simply says, there was a man that was alone. It is lonely not to share your life with anyone. And it's lonely not to share your life for anyone. Again, I'm not talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about just being in relationship with someone. Someone, you may have a bestie, you may have a BFF, you may have someone that you call your friend or acquaintance or someone that you can count on and depend on, someone that you have been in relationship with for a long time. The word here is saying that when you are alone, there is no end to your toil. You are the only one doing the work. I see you, Brother Hunter. You are the only one doing the work. He says, for whom am I toiling? He asks. This is meaningless for me just to be working for who? For what? It's a miserable state of mind. But listen, Ecclesiastes 4 and 8. It says two are better than one. A lot of times, listen, we, we want to be in a crowd. We want to be in a crowd of people. But how many of you know that when you are in a crowd of people, necessarily they're not always going in the direction that you are going in? True followers of God, they, they are listening to the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though they may have to sometimes walk alone, they are not alone. Even though they may have to sometimes leave the crowd, they are not alone. And the Lord, listen, do you remember when the Lord sent the disciples out? He sent them out two by two. He didn't tell them to go by themselves. He sent them out two by two. And is listening to this very word, two are better than one. So we have to, even as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to go about, and I know we go, we go about sharing our faith. But sometimes, in addition to sharing our faith with someone else, we have to share our lives with someone else. We can't be afraid always to share our lives with somebody else, share our testimony with somebody else to let them know who the Lord is and what the Lord has done in our lives. In the church today, it, it's, it's about a group of people. It's about relationship. You know, I, I read somewhere, somewhere, some research that said people have the best experiences in churches when they have a relationship with someone else. When somebody that they know has invited them to church and they can have a relationship inside of the house of God with someone else. How many of you know that when someone comes in the church, some visitor may come and they may join the church, but they perhaps don't know anyone, that they maybe don't stay as long as you want them to stay because there is no relationship. There is a family focus that needs to be in the church that used to be in the church that was in the oh, the church of Ask in the Acts in the New Testament church, and they shared everything. They had everything in common. They gave up their food. They gave up their clothing. They gave up their selves. Every person, every family member, and they didn't have to wait until they came to church to to, the, to ask the apostle to share their faith. They shared it with one another. They let the, the house churches, they shared with one another. They told one another about the goodness of the Lord so that they then could themselves teach one another and be taught in the Lord one another. So that when they got to church, they already knew how to give God praise and glory because they'd already been taught in the Lord. How wonderful would that be if we could just come to our churches and be able just to walk into, listen, enter into the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise because we've already been taught of the things of God by somebody else. Someone has already shared that testimony with us to let us know that there is good news in serving a true and a living God. They taught their family and their friends and they partner with God and each other. That's its relationship. It's about relationship. Two are better than one. Well, why is that? Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 4 and 9 now. Why are two better than one? The word of God says it's because they have a good return for their labor. Not like the one who was working all by himself, but they have a good return for their labor. We become more healthy when we ask someone else, when we invite someone else in to what it is that we're doing. 
whether it be in our natural lives or whether it be in the church of God, our spiritual lives, we, we, we invite someone else in. We are more healthy. We are more wise. You, you've heard it before. Two heads are better than one. What does that mean? I may not have all the answers and you may not have all the answers, but together the word of the Lord says that we can come and reason together. We could come up with the answer that's going to be the best answer. That's going to bring victory into our lives, into that situation. We become more healthy because they have a good return for their labor. Whatever they sow, they have a good return for that labor. It's much easier for two of us to reap the harvest than one of us. Churches get more healthy when, when others around you move from off the sidelines into the game. My, my old pastor used to say, no bench members, no bench members. Everybody's got a role to play because everybody has a role to play that makes it easier on those that are actually doing all the work. None of this 80-20 rule going on in the house of God. Let everybody get in and do their share. And when each person gets in and does their share, the Holy Spirit then will come in and, and ignite them and enable them and infuse them with what it is that he needs so that they can get the job done and get it, get it done effectively and efficiently in the house of God. Two are better than one. And sometimes because it needs to be done, it takes your willing mind, it takes your willing spirit, your willing attitude. Just to say yes to the Lord. Just to say yes. Because the word is saying that somebody has to ask. And when you ask, you have to have a mind and a heart to say yes to the Lord. And allow the Lord then to work a miracle in your life. To work it out in your life. Second, the word is saying if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. If you fall down and you're alone, you have no one to help you up. We all fall down. We all fall down. We all get down. We all get down physically. We all get down emotionally. We all get down spiritually. That's right, Sister Carla. No spectators, only participators. But where do you go if you've not shared your life with somebody when you get down? We expect them to just know that we have a problem. We know that we're down. If we don't show up somewhere, if we don't show up for, for church the next Sunday, we expect them to know that something happened in our lives and we expect them to give us a call. If one of you fall, listen, you wouldn't have anybody to help you up if you're by yourself. Even the word of God says when you're sick, call for the elders of the church because the effective, fervent prayers of the righteous man avails much. Call, you call for them. Call for help. Ask for help. But if you're alone, you may not have anyone to help you up. Who do you turn to? Who do you turn to for help? Who do you turn to for guidance? Who do you turn to for counsel? And I know that we look to the Lord. We turn to the Lord for guidance and for counsel and for help. I know that. But the Lord also sends those in your life physically who you can look at, who you can touch, who you can speak to, who is able to speak a word into your life that's going to quicken your spirit, is going to get you up out of that down state. He is going to get you up from out of that depressed state. He'll get you up from that emotionally down state, that spiritually down state. He's going to send someone in your life to speak a word to you that's going to bring joy into your spirit. He's going to send someone into your life that's going to help you with your mind. Your, your two, two heads are better than one. It's going to help you to reason a thing out. Think a thing out. Let's not discount how the Lord does his work. We understand that God's not coming down here himself but he sends. He sends words through people of God. He sends a word through the word of God when you open your Bible. But let's not try to do this alone. Let's not try to do it alone. Then the thirdly, it says, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Again, I'm not talking about husbands and wives lying in the bed together. I'm not talking about that. 
What I'm talking about here is if you're a soldier on the battlefield and you're camping and you're in the enemy's territory, you're in the enemy's camp and, and it's winter time. Good morning. Good morning, Heidus Palmer. Good morning. And you're just in the winter time. And this is about encouraging one another in the things of God. How are you going to survive in the winter if you're in a battle and you're by yourself? How are you going to survive? You said it earlier, Sister Carla, Satan wants to divide. He wants to get us away from one another. He wants to create division. He wants to create disunity within the body of Christ because he knows that if we're in the winter time, in our winter, we're coming into winter right now. If he knows that when we're in our winter time, if we fall down, if we have no one to help us, we may freeze to death. We may freeze to death. No wonder Hebrews 10 and 25, it says, encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Encourage one another. We need to encourage one another. But oftentimes we try to do it alone or we say, I I don't want to be bothered. Listen, the word of the Lord is telling us to have relationship, have relationship. Because even in the body of Christ, being on the front line, being in the way that Satan's darts and traps and tricks and arrows can get you, that is difficult. It's difficult. And you expect you know, you expect the bullets that you can see them where you can get out of the way and you can dodge them. But I talked about it the other day, or maybe it must have been Sunday, yesterday, that there are some times when Satan throws a dart at you and you may be able to dodge that dart and then immediately another one comes, immediately another one comes. And he does that to get you off focus. He does that to distract you from calling on the name of Jesus. And how many of you know that when it rains, it pours? That ain't in the word of God, but sometimes when it rains, it pours. Things happen. Your, your kids start acting up. Your, your finances start going crazy. Your, your refrigerator breaks at home. Things start happening, and so it begins to take your mind off of calling on the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan comes to distract the people of God. But when you are distracted, you need someone to help you get back on track. You need someone to tell you that everything is going to be all right. You need someone to tell you that the Lord is your guide. He is your provision. You need someone to tell you that he is your salvation. You need someone to tell you that God is your help. You need to be reminded. Listen, that the Lord has you covered. Even in situations where your health may be failing. The enemy wants you to be by yourself so that no one will remind you of a great thing. But you have to know that when everything, it seems like everything is coming against you, when Satan comes against you, when he has pulled out every weapon in his arsenal, we need somebody to lean on. I'm talking about partnership with purpose. You need somebody to lean on. Isaiah 54 and 17, it says, good morning, Pastor Jones. It says, there is no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper. I'm going to keep reading the same scripture. It says, in every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, it, thou shall, the Lord shall condemn it. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The Lord will take care of whatever is concerning you. He will take care of it, whatever it is concerning you. And that's why this last verse, it says, thou, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. When it feels like I'm alone, when it feels like my back is up against the wall, I understand that the Lord will fight my battle and that there is no weapon that is formed against me that shall prosper. But the scripture goes on to say that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. There is a reason that we need to be in relationship with somebody else. There is strength in numbers. There is strength in coming together with somebody, divinely coming together with someone. There is strength in that. We need one another. I need you. You need me. The road does not have to be as hard as we're making it. Things does not have to be as difficult as we're making it because we're trying to do it alone. I recognize that Lord, the Lord is here, but oftentimes Satan makes it so that we're so distracted. We're so bombarded with issues that we don't know to call on the name of Jesus. 
I'm telling you right now, we need one another. Partner with someone so their purpose in your life may be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. That the enemy may not no longer distract you, no longer tempt you away from him, the Lord. No longer get you off focus, but that you may become victorious because you are not alone. Two are better than one. And even in all of what Solomon was saying, I want to end with this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. Because even though he was saying everything was vanity, it was meaningless, it was purposeless. What he's saying in chapter 12, the last verse, he says, it's all about God. Worship him. Follow his plan. That's our purpose. He is, only is, the all-knowing judge. Listen, stop trying to do this thing alone. Stop trying to walk this walk alone. Stop trying to do this work alone. Partner with someone. Partner with a purpose. So that the life that God has for you will be fulfilled. And will be manifested with joy and peace. If this word has been a blessing for you. And you believe it will be a blessing to somebody else. I ask that you will share it. But not only that. For those of you who are trying to do this thing alone. For those of you who are trying to do this thing by yourself. I will say to you. You ask the Lord. Who it is that should be in your life. That you can partner with. That you can pray with. That can be your prayer partner. That can be your accountability partner. That can be one that will be your support. That will be one that will be help to be your guide. I'm talking about someone mature in the Lord. That can give you godly, godly counsel in regard to those things that you are going through. So that you will not have to go through this thing alone. And that you will never have to lean on the, on Satan for advice. Lean on Satan for what it is that he you think he may have for you. Don't do this alone. I need you. You need me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I bless your name for this word, oh God. And I thank you, Lord, for this word, God, of power, God, of purpose, oh Lord God. And I thank you, Lord God, that even God, those of us who have tried to do this thing by ourselves, we recognize now, God, that your word is telling us that relationship, God, is important. Relationship is powerful, Lord God. Even God and what it is that we've set out to do, God, from a natural standpoint. Lord, we don't know everything, Lord God. We know you know. You know every you know every single thing, oh Lord God. But Lord, we don't know. And I ask, oh God, that you, God, will connect us with those, God, who will have the skills, God, the, the ability, Lord God, the influence, oh Lord God, the power, Lord God, to help us. And when you connect us with that person, oh Lord God, I just believe, Lord God, our lives, God, will soar. We thank you, Lord God, that the pride in our lives, God, has been. Uh, God rebuked in the name of Jesus, oh Lord God. No more pride, Lord God. No more vanity, Lord God. It's all about you. It's not about us anyway, oh Lord God. We we do this all, God, for your glory. And God, because it is for your glory, Lord, I just ask you to continue, God, to bless us, God. Continue to heal us in a mighty way, oh Lord God. God, right now, I ask that you will just touch Brother Hunter right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. I don't know what it, his situation is, oh Lord, but you know, because you know everything, Lord God. I ask that you, God, give him peace of mind in the situation that he is going through, Lord God. Continue, God, to heal him. Deliver him, Lord God, from every infirmity, Lord God, every sin, sickness, oh Lord God. Deliver him right now in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. And then God set his feet, God, on solid ground that he will not, God, go to the left or to the right, Lord God, but he will continue, God, in your way. I thank you, Lord God, for the people of God that are on this broadcast, God, this morning and those that shall listen, God, later. I pray, God, your blessings upon each and every one of them, God. Continue, God, to shout Power, God, every good thing, God, upon them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you stay the hand of Satan, oh, out of their lives, oh God. Stop him, God, oh, his tricks, his schemes, oh Lord, oh my God. God, let not the people of God run into God, his tricks and his schemes, God. Not them let fall for it, oh God, but continue, God, to allow us, God, to look to you, God, from which our helps cometh from. I thank you, Lord God, there shall be peace, God, in this day, Lord God, that God, everything that we do, God, everything that we touch, oh Lord God, God shall show your glory in our 
our lives. And for that, God, we give you praise and glory. Now, Lord, I ask you would just bless us to Mary, God, as she goes, God, through surgery. God, I thank you, Lord, God, that you already have healed her. Lord, God, for every physician that shall touch her right now, I pray favor over her right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And then, God, I speak peace to her mind, oh, God. I speak peace to Kip right now, oh, God, to let them know, God, that you have this under control. And, God, when she comes out, Lord, God, oh, Lord, God, she will come out rejoicing because of the thing that you have done in her life, oh, Lord, God. I give you praise and glory for it right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, people of God. We thank you so much for joining. And um, I will see you again tomorrow. And tomorrow um, is Giving Tuesday in the United States. And so I'm going to prepare you for that. Tomorrow I'm going to uh, put up a link um, for those of you who want to contribute to the Kingdom Life, to its ministry. I'm going to ask that you do that on tomorrow, Tuesday, the 27th of November, because it is Giving Tuesday. And there are many things, many um, programs and that we have options for you to give to. One would be our housing project that we're going to be talking about on tomorrow. Another is our robotics team that we're talking about as well. And also for the Be Inspired talk show, we're just going to be asking you to contribute whatever it is that you'd like to contribute to the ministry so that the work of the Lord can go forth with power. And of course, if you want to contribute to this broadcast, you certainly may do that as well. Um, I'll throw a cash app up here if you'd like to contribute to that as well. But tomorrow for sure, we're going to be asking you to contribute to the ministry because it is Giving Tuesday. We love you with the love of Jesus. You go in peace.